Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today I'll be taking you through the reading section of SAT Practice Test 7. I'll be giving you my tips and tricks for the reading section as well as answer explanations for each passage and its subsequent questions. Make sure to subscribe for more content and let's go ahead and get started with passage 1. Alright, so I'm going to read the passage. If you've already read the passage, you can go ahead and skip about 3 minutes ahead to where I start getting into the answer explanations. So I'll go ahead and get started with questions 1 through 10 in passage 1. This passage is adopted from George Eliot. Silas Marner, originally published in 1861, Silas was a weaver and a notorious miser, but then the gold he had hoarded was stolen. Shortly after, Silas adopted a young child, Epi, the daughter of an impoverished woman who had died suddenly. Unlike the gold which needed nothing and must be worshipped in closed locked solitude, which was hidden away from the daylight, was deaf to the song of birds, and started to know human tones, Epi was a creature of endless claims and ever-growing desires, seeking and loving sunshine and living sounds and living moments making trial of everything with, new tr with trust and new joy and stirring the human kindness in all eyes that looked on her. The gold had kept his, his thoughts in an ever-repeated cycle, leading to nothing beyond itself, but Epi was an object compacted of changes and hopes that forced his thoughts onward and carried them far away from their old, eager pacing towards the same blank limit, carried them away to the new things that would come with the coming years when Epi would have learned to understand how her father Silas cared for her and made him look for images of the time and the ties and charities that bound together the families of his neighbors. The gold had asked he should sit weaving longer and longer, deafened and blinded more and more to all things except the monotony of his loom and the repetition of his web. But Epi called him away from his weaving and made him think of all its pauses, a holiday, reawakening his senses with her fresh life, even to the old winter flies that came crawling forth in the early spring sunshine and warning him into joy because she had joy. And when the sunshine grew strong and lasting, so that the buttercups were thick in the meadows, Silas might be seen in the sunny midday or in the late afternoon when the shadows were lengthening under the hedgerows, strolling out with uncovered head to carry Epi beyond the stone pits to where the flowers grew, till they reached, till they reached some favorite bank where he could sit down. While Epi toddled to pluck, pluck the flowers and make remarks to the winged things that murmured happily above the bright petals, calling Dad Dad's attention continually by bringing him to the flowers. Then she would turn her ear to some sudden bird note, and Silas learned to please her by making signs of hushed stillness, that they might listen for the note to come again, so that when it came, she set up her small back and laughed with gurgling triumph. Sitting on the banks in this way, Silas began to look for the once familiar herbs again, and as the leaves with their unchanged outline and markings lay on his palm, there was a sense of crowding remembrances from which he turned away timidly, taking refuge in Epi's little world that lay lightly on his enfeebled spirit. As the child's mind was growing into knowledge, his mind was growing into memory. As her life unfolded, his soul, long stupefied in a cold, narrow prison, was unfolding too, and trembling gradually into full consciousness. It was an influence which must gather force with every new year. The tones that stirred Silas's heart grew articulate and called for more distinct answers. Shapes and sounds grew clearer for Epi's eyes and ears, and there was more that Dad Dad was imperatively required to notice and account for. Also, by the time Epi was three years old, she developed a fine capacity for mischief and for devising ingenious ways of being troublesome, which found much exercise not only, on, not only for Silas's patience, but for his watchfulness and penetration. Sorely was poor Silas puzzled on such occasions by the incompatible demands of love. All right, let's go ahead and get into question one. Which choice best describes the major theme of the passage? Well, if we think about the passage, it's all about Silas overcoming his former greed and now really enjoying his life far more now that he has experienced this parental love, right? So our answer there is going to be D, the restorative power of parental love, right? Silas, his life is restored by the love he has for Epi, right? So our answer there will be D. It's not the bittersweet brevity of child naivety because we don't really touch on that, right? That's not the main, main thing on it. Although, although Epi is portrayed, you know, as a child and having that pureness, right? The moral purity of children, that's not the major theme, right? We want to look big picture when it says major theme. And then we have the corrupting influence of a materialistic society. No, that is also not the major theme, right? Those are minor things. All right, two, as compared with Silas's gold, Epi is portrayed as having more. While we look through our answer choices, we see vitality, right? Vitality basically is just going to mean life, right? Silas's gold didn't have life, right? It just kind of stayed there. Whereas Epi is curious, right? And engages Silas's mind so much more, right? So she has much more vitality. We don't talk about durability, right? We don't talk about protection, right? And it even says that Epi is not 
right? She's kind of vulnerable. She's still a child, so that wouldn't make sense. And self-sufficiency, we specifically say that Epi isn't self-sufficient like the gold was, right? So our answer there is A. Question three, which statement best describes a technique the narrator uses to represent Silas's character before he adopted Epi? Well, if we think about it, what he does is he describes how Silas treated his gold, right? And how he had to make certain behaviors with his gold and he contrasts that to how Silas behaves with Epi. So if we look at this, we have the narrator emphasizes Silas, Silas's former obsession with wealth by depicting his gold as requiring certain behaviors on his part. And that'll be our answer, right? It, it's not gonna be B, it underscores his former greed by describing his gold as seeming to reproduce on its own because we don't say that, we don't even insinuate that it reproduces on its own. Sorry, I should have X'd out B, I accidentally circled it. C, the narrator hints at Silas's former antisocial attitude by contrasting his present behavior with his neighbors with his past behavior. No, we don't do that, so we can get rid of C. And D, the narrator demonstra demonstrates Silas's former lack of self-awareness by implying he is unable to recall life for Epi. No, he does recall it right. It discusses how he treats his gold, or how he treated his gold in the past. All right, question four. The narrator uses the phrase making trial of everything in line seven to present Epi as what? We're going to go to line seven, find what it's talking about. We have Epi was a creature of endless claims and ever-growing desires, seeking and loving sunshine and living sounds and living moments, making trial of everything with trust in new joy and stern human kindness and all eyes that looked on her. When we say making trial of everything, we're really just describing Epi as curious, right? Everything she sees, she wants to play with, right? She wants to know more about it. So that is going to be curious, B. All right, question five. According to the narrator, one consequence of Silas adopting Epi is what? Well, it's not that he denounced all desire for money. It never explicitly says he doesn't want any money anymore. He just has less of a desire. Not, but he hasn't renounced all desire. That's the key part there, right? So that's going to be wrong. B, better understands his place in nature. That is not going to be true, right? Although we discuss nature, it never explicitly or implicitly really says that Silas now better understands his place in nature. C seems more accepting of help from others. We never discuss him getting help from others. We can get rid of C. And D looks forward to a different kind of future. That is true. And I believe our next question is probably evidence. It is. And I can go ahead and show you how I would support this, right? So he looks forward to a different kind of future. If we remember back to paragraph one and aligns 11 right here to about 16, we've got, but Epi was an object compacted of changes and hopes that forced his thoughts onward, right? So forced his thoughts onward to the future, carried them away from their past, right? So once again, moving towards the future, right? Carried them away from the past, right? Where he was moving towards the same blank limit and carried them away to new things. Once again, carrying them to the future, right? That would come with the coming years. So that's going to be our evidence there. That's 11 to 16. So our answer is going to be B. All right, question seven. What function does the second paragraph, lines 30 to 52, serve in the passage as a whole? All right, let's go ahead and find that second paragraph just to refresh on what it was, 30 to 52. All right, this is the interactions between Silas and Epi, right? And what it's doing throughout this interaction is it's illustrating how Silas, his life is becoming more engaging and how it's changing as a result of Epi, right? So if we go look at our answer choices, We've got, it presents the particular moment at which Silas realized Epi was changing him. No, we never are told or can really tell that that's the exact moment, so we can get rid of answer A, because it could have been before, we don't know. B, it highlights Silas's love for Epi by depicting the sacrifices he makes for her. What sacrifices, right? He's really just playing with her. There's nothing big there, right? So we can go ahead and get rid of B. C, it illustrates the effect Epi has on Silas by describing the interaction between them. Yes, that whole paragraph, it's just kind of, illustrating and letting people imagine the interaction going on so that they can see the love that they have for each other and how it's changed Silas. And then D, it reveals a significant alteration in the relationship, but it does not. All right, in describing the relationship between Epi and Silas, the narrator draws a connection between Epi's what? Well, if we think about it, when we look at, looking at our answer choices, right? We never make a connection between Epi's physical vulnerability and Silas's emotional fragility, right? We're never even necessarily told that Silas is emotionally fragile, so we can get rid of A. B, expanding awareness and Silas's increasing engagement in life or with life. Yes, absolutely. And I'll go ahead and show you where we have that, right? If we go back up, we see from 53 to 57, we say, as the child's mind is growing into knowledge, his mind is growing into memory, right? So as the child was growing older, Silas was growing into memory, right? As her life unfolded, right? So as she grew older, her life unfolded, she's engaging in more things. Her eyes are opening up to the world at large. 
his soul, long stupefied in the cold, narrow prison, was unfolding too, right? So he's becoming more engaged with life. He's no longer cold and narrow. He doesn't have a cold and narrow soul like he used to. It's now unfolding and opening up, trembling gradually into full consciousness, right? So it looks like we got an evidence question for that one. So we can go ahead and answer D, 53 to 57, like I just showed you, right, and told you why. And that really shows how Silas, as Epi expanded her awareness, growing older, Silas increased his engagement with life, growing into full consciousness, right? Now we can go ahead and look at question 10. As used in line 65, find most nearly means what? Find line 65, underline find, read the sentence, come up with our own answer before looking at the answer choices so we aren't swayed by them. Also, by the time Epi was three years old, she developed a fine capacity for mischief, right? That means that this fine capacity, right? A large capacity, right? Something like that. A keen capacity, and either, either of those would be good, good word choices there. Large would be kind of basic, though, so we'd probably be looking for something a little better than that. So we look at A, an acceptable capacity. No, we want it to indicate that it's, you know, a con, like a, a really solid capacity for it, right? Delicate, nope. Ornate, ornate really kind of means sort of like unique, if you want to think about it that way. It's, it's kind of more used with shapes. It's really not a good fit here. And then D, a keen capacity, right? A keen capacity for, let's go ahead and just refresh on what that was. Keen capacity for mischief, right? She had a fine capacity for it, a keen capacity for it. She was very drawn to mischief, right? So those are, that's going to be our answer for what it most nearly means in that context, right? So our answer for 10 will be D. We move on to passage 2, which questions 11 to 21 are based on. This passage is adopted from David Rotman, How Technology is Destroying Jobs, published in 2013 by MIT Technology Review. MIT business scholars Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee have argued that impressive advances in computer technology from improved industrial robotics to automated translation services are largely behind the sluggish employment growth of the last 10 to 15 years. Even more ominous for workers, they foresee dismal prospects for many types of jobs as these powerful new technologies are increasingly adopted not only in manufacturing, clerical, and retail work, but in professions such as law, financial services, education, and medicine. That robots, automation, and software can replace people might seem obvious to anyone who's worked in an automotive manufacturing or as a travel agent. But Brynjolfsson and McAfee's claim is more troubling and controversial. They believe that rapid technological change has been destroying jobs faster than it is creating them contributing to the stagnation of the median income and growth of inequality in the United States, and they suspect something similar is happening in other technologically advanced countries. As evidence, Brynjolfsson and McAfee point to a chart that only an economist could love. In economics, productivity, the amount of an economic value created for a given unit of input, such as an hour of labor, is a crucial indicator of growth and wealth production, or wealth creation. It is a measure of progress. On the chart, Brynjolfsson likes to show separate lines represent productivity and total employment in the United States for years after World War II. The two lines track closely together with increases in jobs corresponding to increases in productivity. The pattern is clear. As businesses generated more value from their workers, the country as a whole became richer, which fueled more economic activity and created even more jobs than, be than beginning in 2000. The lines diverge. Productivity continues to rise robustly, but employment suddenly wilts. By 2011, a significant gap appears between the two lines, showing economic growth with no parallel increase in job creation. Brynjolfsson and McAfee call it the great decoupling, and Brynjolfsson says he is confident that technology is behind both the healthy growth and productivity and the weak growth in jobs. It's a startling assertion because it threatens the faith that many economists place in technological progress. Brynjolfsson and McAfee still believe that technology boosts productivity and makes societies wealthier, but they think that it can also have a dark side. Technological processes eliminating the need for many types of jobs and leave the, leaving the typical worker worse off than before. Bryn Jolfson can point to a second chart indicating that median income is falling, is failing to rise even as GDP soars. It's the great paradox of our era, he says. Productivity is at record levels. Innovation has never been faster, and yet at the same time, we have a falling median income and we have fewer jobs. People are falling behind because technology is advancing so fast and our skills and organizations aren't keeping up. While technological changes can be painful for workers whose skills no longer need, no longer match the needs of employers, Lawrence Katz, a Harvard, Harvard economist, says that no historical pattern shows these shifts leading to a net decrease in jobs over an extended period. Katz has done extensive research on how technological advances have affected jobs over the last few centuries, describing, for example, how highly skilled artisans in the mid-19th century were displaced by lower skilled workers in factories. While it can take decades for new workers to acquire the expertise 
needed for new types of employment, he says we have never run out of jobs. There is no long-term trend of eliminating work for people. Over the long term, employment rates are fairly stable. People have always been able to create new jobs. People come up with new things to do. Still, Katz doesn't dismiss the notion that there is something different about today's digital technologies, something that could affect an even broader range of work. The question, he says, is whether economic history will serve as a useful guide. Will the job disruptions caused by technology be temporary as the workforce adapts, or will we see a science fiction scenario in which automated processes and robots with superhuman skills take over a broad swath of human tasks? Though Katz expects the historical pattern to hold, it is genuinely a question. He says, if technology disrupts enough, who knows what will happen? All right, question one. The main purpose of the passage is to what? All right, well, if we come up with our own answer first, we'd really want to discuss how the main purpose of the passage is talking about the impact that these advancements in technology are having on jobs and job growth, right? We know that as technology, we'll just call that T, has improved, right? It's gotten increasingly better. They're talking about how job growth, right? Job growth has gone down, right? And this is a break in trend, at least for the short term, right? Long term, Katz expects this trend to hold, he says, but he's also kind of uncertain, right? So if you look at our answer choices, we see A, examine the role of technology in workers' lives during the last century. No, we're not examining its role in workers' lives. B, advocate better technology. No, we're not advocating technology. We're more assessing the situation. C, are you? We aren't making an argument, really, but are you for changes in how technology is deployed? We aren't making an argument. We're not making any value judgments. D, assess the impact of advancements in technology on overall job growth. Absolutely. That's going to be our answer there. All right, 12, according to Bryn Jolfson and McAfee, advancements in technology since approximately the year 2000 have resulted in what? Like I just set up there, advancements in technology has caused job growth to decrease. Low job growth in the United States will be our answer, which is choice A. Question 13, which choice provides the best evidence? That was given right in that introduction. We can go back up. I'll go ahead and show you guys where that is. We see that we start at 1. We say MIT business scholars Eric Bryn Jolfson and Andrew McAfee have argued that impress, impressive advances in computer technology, right? So technology going up. From improved industrial robotics to automated translation services are largely behind the sluggish employment growth of the last 10 to 15 years, which puts us right around 2000, right? So this was published in 2013. So our answer then is going to be lines 1 to line 6 for our evidence. Go find that, and that is answer choice A for 13. All right, question 14. The main purpose of lines, the primary purpose of lines 26 to 28, the amount to labor is to what? Let's go find it. We've got 26 to 28. Okay, so what I see in, in economics, productivity, now starting what looks to be a definition, the amount of economic value created for a given unit of output, such as an hour of labor, Right, this is a non-essential phrase or clause, right, as denoted by these two m dashes, and that's telling me, once I read through the sentence, obviously, I see that productivity. We're just defining it as the amount of economic value created for a given unit of input. So we're just defining a term. That's going to be our answer, right? Defining a term or explaining our term, right? We don't have to define a term, so our answer will be explain a term, which is answer choice D. All right, question 15. As used in line 35, clear most nearly means. Well, I'm going to go find 35. I'm going to underline clear. I'll read through my sentence. The pattern is clear. As businesses generated more value from their workers, the country as a whole became richer. All right, so the pattern then is obviously clear, right? So our word for that, we could say that that's unmistakable. It's obvious, right? The pattern is definite. All of those would be good answer choices. So we look at what we have. We have keen, right? That is not going to be our answer, right? The pattern is pure. No, that's not going to be our answer either. The pattern is untroubled no but the pattern is unmistakable right when we say the pattern is clear we're saying that it's glaringly obvious right there's no way that anyone could distinguish anything other than that pattern right there's no way that anyone can refute it it is unmistakable that is the best answer choice there all right question 16 which of the following best characterizes cat's attitude towards today's technologies in lines 81 to 82 all right, well, if we think about what he's saying about today's technologies, if we go back up, we'll go ahead and read it just to, you know, make sure that we have a good grasp. So it said 81 to 82. Still, Katz doesn't dismiss the notion that there's something different about today's technologies, something that could have an effect, an even broader, that something that could have an even broader, something that could affect an even broader range of work. Okay, there we go. So what was the question asking? Let's see. What best characterizes his attitude towards toward day, today's digital technologies? Well, he's obviously concerned a little bit, right? But he's not concerned about countries increasing reliance on it, right? So we can get rid of A. B, he's unconcerned about their effect. 
Well, he goes on, remember, in the last part to say that he doesn't know completely, right? He's uncertain how these might impact job growth in the future. Well, he expects that trend to hold, the trend historically, right, that it doesn't affect job growth in the long run. He does say that he's not totally certain. So our answer there will be C. D, he's over -optimist. he is optimistic they will spur job creation. No. All right, and then we look at our answer choices for our next question. We're asked to provide evidence. Well, that's going to be D, and here's how I know it's D, because I remember at the end, lines 91 to 92, it shows his uncertainty when he says, if technology disrupts enough, who knows what will happen? That's completely showing that he's uncertain about it, and that'll be our answer choice. Now we're asked, as used in line 83, range most nearly means what? I go up, I find line 83, I see I've got range right here, underline it, read the sentence, come with my own answer. All right, so we have, still cats doesn't dismiss the notion there's something different about today's digital technology, something that could affect an even broader range of work. All right, this could be, this one's a little bit tricky, but I would definitely say scope would be a great answer, right? It could affect an even broader scope of work. We don't want to use anything talking about position, right? Because that's what people who don't go back to the text and don't use that context are going to put down. So anything to do with position or place, that's going to be wrong. We want to avoid that. Right, so we can go down, look at our answer choices. We have region. That would be if you mistook this and didn't go back and read it in context. Same with distance and position. Now scope will be our answer, right? That's talking about the scope of these changes in employment, right? In occupations. We're not going to use region. That's, once again, referring to place. We don't want to use that here. We want to use what it means in context. And all those other ones refer to place. So our answer is B. All right, 19. According to figure one, which of the following years shows the widest gap between percentages of productivity and employment? We go to figure one, find the largest gap. I see my largest gap is right from here, right? So any answer right around in these, there'll probably only be one because you don't have a ruler, right? You can't measure it out completely. So right around 2013 is where I'm going to be looking for an answer choice. And I see that I have that. I've got C and D. Those are both pretty close, so I'll go double check. All right, so 2007 versus 2013. If I look at 2007, we've got that long versus this long we clearly see 13 is larger. So my answer there will be 2013. All right, that's D. Question 20, which statement is supported by figure two? Well, let's go quick, take a quick look at figure two. I see that this is my output per worker and I see it has climbed for all three of these countries over time. All right, so we've got the country with the greatest growth in output per manufacturing worker from 1960 to 1990 was Germany. I'm just going to go ahead and look and see if I can find that answer I just had because sometimes on those graphing ones they put the most obvious one as the answer because otherwise you got to check everything else. And I see in C I've got each of these three countries experienced an increase in its output per worker from 1960 to 2011 and that is a fact, right? All three bars, right? All three bars that were placed next to each other over that long term they all went up. All right, now we got 21. Which additional information if presented in figure two would be most useful in evaluating the statement in lines 57 to 60 from productivity to jobs? All right, well, when we read that sentence, we have productivity is at record levels, innovation has never been faster, and yet at the same time, we have a falling median income. So one thing that would help is if I had median income over all those years, and if we had job data for all those years, right, the number of jobs. So I'm going to go ahead and look down here for either of those answers. I see in A, I have the median income of employees as it compares across all three countries in a single year. Problem with this is that it's a single, in a single year, not over time. I can't make a conclusion based on one year because I won't know how it changed, right? So I can't say it was falling as they said. In B, I have the number of people employed in factories from 1960 to 1911, and that's going to be my answer, right? And here's why. That's showing me job data, right? People employed in factories 1960 to 2011. That'll tell me kind of if the overall employment is going up. I wouldn't say that this is a great answer. It is the answer, don't get me wrong, but what would make this answer even better is if they just said the number of people employed, period, right? The number of people employed from 1960 to 2011. Because this in factories, we don't really touch necessarily too much in that statement here, 56 to 70, or 57 to 60, about factories specifically. But B still would be the best answer because if we look at C and D, they are not, they're not even close. We have C, the types of organizations at which output of employed persons was measured. No, like I just said, we don't even care about types of organizations really, which is why I think that this one could be made, that B could be made better if it didn't include factories. D, the kind of manufacturing tasks most frequently taken over by machines. We also don't need that to support that point in 5760. So our answer is B. We go ahead and move on to passage three, which questions to 22 to 31 are based on. This passage is adopted from Patricia Waldron, Why Birds Fly in a V Formation, 
published in 2014 by American Association for the Advancement of Science. Anyone watching the autumn sky knows that migrating birds fly in a V formation, but scientists have long debated why. A new study of ibises found that these big-winged big birds carefully position their fingertips and sink their flapping, presumably to catch the preceding bird's updraft and save energy during flight. There are two reasons birds might fly in a V formation. It may make flight easier, or they're simply following the leader. Squadrons of planes can save fuel by flying in a V formation, and many scientists suspect that migrating birds do the same. Models that, create, models that treated flapping birds like fixed-wing airplanes estimate that they save energy by drafting off each other, but currents created by airplanes are far more stable than the oscillating eddies coming off of a bird. Air gets pretty unpredictable behind a flapping wing, says James Usherwood, a locomotor biomechanist at the Royal Veterinary College at the University of London in Hatfield, where the research took place. The study published in Nature took advantage of an existing project to reintroduce endangered north bald ibises to Europe. Scientists used a microlight plane to show hand-raised birds their ancestral migration route from Austria to Italy. A flock of 14 juveniles carried data loggers specially built by Usherwood, Usherwood and his lab. The device's GPS determined each bird's flight position within 30 centimeters, and an accelerometer showed the timing of the wing flaps. Just as aerodynamic estimates would predict, the birds positioned themselves to fly just behind into the side of the bird in front, timing their wing beats to catch the uplifting eddies. When a bird flew directly behind another, the timing of the flapping reversed so that it could minimize the effects of the downdraft coming off the back of the bird's body. We didn't think this was possible, Usherwood says, considering that the feat requires careful flight and incredible awareness of one's neighbors. Perhaps these big V formation birds can be thought of quite like an airplane with wings that go up and down. The findings likely apply to other long-winged birds such as pelicans, storks, and geese. Usherwood says, smaller birds create more complex wakes that would be make difficult that would make drafting too difficult the researchers did not attempt to calculate the bird's energy savings because the necessary physiological me measurements would be too invasive for an endangered species previous studies estimate that birds can use 20 percent to 30 percent less energy while flying in av from a behavioral perspective it's really a breakthrough says david lentink a mechanical engineer at stanford university in palo alto california who was not involved in the work Showing that birds care about sinking their wing beats is definitely an important insight that we didn't have before. Scientists do not know how the birds find that aerodynamic sweet spot, but they suspect that the animals align themselves either by sight or by sensing air currents through their feathers. Alternatively, they may move around until they find the location with the least resistance. In future studies, the researchers will switch to a more common bird, such as pigeons or geese. They plan to investigate how the animals decide who sets the course and the pace, and whether a mistake by the leader can ripple through the rest of the flock to cause traffic jams. It's a pretty impressive piece of work as it is, but it does suggest there's a lot more to learn, says Ty Hendrick, a biologist at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who studies flight aerodynamics in birds and insects. However they do it, he says, birds are awfully good hand glider pilots. All right, the main purpose of the passage is what? Well, if we think about the main purpose, what we're doing here is we're explaining research, right? We're explaining research about why these birds are flying in that V formation, right? So that will be answer choice C, right? We're explaining research conducted to study why some birds fly in a V formation. If we look at our other answer choices, we have A, describe how squadrons of planes can save fuel by flying in a v, v formation. We're not talking about squadrons of planes, so we can just get rid of A altogether. B, discuss the effects of downdrafts on birds and airplanes. Once again, you'd be focusing too narrow on this airplanes if you answered B, right? We're focused on birds. The airplanes was really just to explain it using a commonplace example. Right now we have D illustrate how birds sense air currents through their feathers. Once again, you'd be focusing too narrowly on that like last paragraph where we talk about how birds may be sensing where to go in that V formation. Right? We don't want to be too narrow. We want to look at the big picture, which is choice C. Question 23. The author includes the quotation: "Air gets pretty unpredictable behind a flapping wing." In lines 17 to 18, to do what? Well, guys, when you're given a lines 17 to 18 or any lines and you have to answer a question on it, it's always helpful to go back. So we're going to go ahead and do that, right? So if we go back to lines 17 and 18, we see air gets pretty unpredictable behind a flapping wing. But what comes before it? Because we need context. We have, starting in 13, models that treated flapping birds like fixed wing airplanes estimate that they save energy by drafting off each other, but currents created by airplanes are far more stable than the oscillating eddies coming off of a bird. Air is pretty unpredictable behind a flapping wing. Well, what we're doing from 13 all the way to 18 is we're comparing the airplanes, right, the drafting behind airplanes, the drafting behind 
these birds, right? So what we're doing when we say that it's unpredictable, let me find where are we at, right here, okay. So what we're doing when we say that the air gets pretty unpredictable behind that flapping wing is we're explaining that that current created by that bird differs from that uniform air predictability that comes behind that airplane, right? We're explaining that difference. So our answer there will be A, right? We're not stressing the amount of control the birds have in that V formation or indicating wind movement or emphasizing that there's power in the flapping of the bird's wings, right? Our answer is A. Question 24, what can be reasonably inferred about the reason Usher would use northern bald ibises as the subjects of his study? Well, if we remember back to the passage, and I'm guessing we have evidence as, we do have evidence as our next question, so I'll go and find that as I do it. If we remember back in the passage, it talks about how they were using these other ones that they pretty much, you know, they were close to, right? And that they just had easy access to. It wasn't anything in particular about why they wanted to use that species. It was just they had good access to them. So I'll go ahead and show you guys where that was. We see that it is in this paragraph here, right? This, or it looks like it, yep. Okay, the study published in Nature took advantage of an existing project to reintroduce endangered northern bald ibises to Europe, right? So they just wanted to make use of that existing project. It was just easily accessible. And that's lines 22 to 24. So we'll go ahead and find that answer, 22 to 24, C. And then for 24, we've got the ibises were well acquainted. No, Usher would knew the ibises were familiar. No, the ibises have a body design similar to an airplane. No, D, the ibises were easily accessible for Usherwood and his team to track and observe. Absolutely. We already got evidence in 25. Question 26, what's the most likely reason the author includes a 30 centimeter measurement? Once again, we want to go back to that text, use that line 30 it's telling us, right? We go back to line 30, we see that it says the device's GPS determined each bird's flight position to within 30 centimeters. That is going to be telling us that sort of margin of error, right? Telling us how accurately this is, data is being collected. So we'll look at our answer choices, A, to demonstrate the accuracy with which the data loggers collected the data, and that is the correct answer. B, to present recorded data? No, it's presenting that margin of error, right? That accuracy, the level of accuracy of that data that's being collected. C, provide the wingspan? No. D, show far, how far behind the plane they flew? No. All right, 27, what does the author imply about pelicans, storks, and geese flying in a V formation? And we're asked for evidence, so I'll go ahead and take you guys back to what I'm looking at right off the bat. So when we talk about those pelicans and stor storks, I remember that that was right around here, right? The findings likely apply to other long-winged birds, such as pelicans, storks, and geese, Usherwood says, right? So basically his claim then, right, if we go down here, his claim then is that, no, they don't expend more energy than ibises, but they create that similar weight, right? Those, all these long-winged birds is what he's talking about, the long-winged birds, they create that similar weight so that they can draft off of each other, right? So our answer there will be C. And then for our evidence for that, what jumped out to me as I was reading it for evidence for that, right, was right here when he says the findings apply to other long-winged birds, right? So that would be from 45 to 47. But what I see in my answer choices for evidence is I don't have that, right? I'm not given that. But what I am given is I am given 47 to 48. Now here's why 47 to 48 works. Because it says smaller birds create more complex wakes that would make drafting too difficult. We are talking about large birds, right? So when we say that these smaller birds, their wakes are more complex and make drafting too difficult, we're kind of doing addition by subtraction. And here's what I mean by that. We're insinuating when we say this, we're insinuating that those larger birds then, their wakes are less complex and they are able to draft. So our answer then is going to be from 47 to 48, right? Go ahead and find that, right? I'll go ahead and show you why the other ones are wrong real quick. We got 35 to 38. When a bird flew directly behind one another, the timing of the flapping reversed so it can minimize the effects of downdraft coming off the back of the bird's body. We haven't started talking about those other animals though, those other birds, so we can get rid of that one. It's too early in the passage. And then we got 52 to 54. Go take a quick look at that. And that says previous studies estimate that birds can use 20 to 30% less energy while flying in a V. Once again, that's not specific to those species we were talking about, right? Those storks and pelicans, I think is what it was. But either way, right? That's not, not specific to the one we were talking about. So we can get rid of that. And then 66 to 67, I believe is also not specific to the birds we were talking about. Alternatively, they may move around until they find the location of least resistance. That is also not specific, right? So we know our answer then will be B, 29. What is the main idea of the seventh paragraph in lines 62 to 73? We'll go find that. We always want to reference those lines as we're answering. We see we've got it right here, right? So we got scientists do not know how the birds find that aerodynamic sweet spot, but they suspect that animals align themselves either by sight or sensing air currents through feathers. Alternatively, they may move around until they find the location of least resistance. In the future studies, the researchers will switch to more common birds 
They plan to investigate how the animals decide who sets the course and pace and whether a mistake made by the leader can ripple through the rest of the flock. What that's doing is talking about future studies that they want to do. So I'm going to look for an answer that focuses in on that aspect of the writing. So we've got A, different types of hierarchies exist. No, mistakes can happen when a long-winged birds create a V formation. No, they're going to investigate whether that happens, but they're not making that claim. C, future research will help scientists better understand V formations. Absolutely, it's all about those future experiments they want to do to learn more about the V formations. D, long-winged birds watch the lead bird closely. Once again, that's what they want to test, right? That's not making a claim there. That would be focusing too much on that one sentence in that paragraph. 30, the author uses the phrase aerodynamic sweet spot in line 63, most likely what? Like we said, if we're given a line to go to, we want to go to that line, even if we're confident, because you never know you could be making a mistake. Scientists do not know how the birds find that aerodynamic dynamic sweet spot, but they suspect they align themselves either by sight or sensing currents through their feathers. All right, what he means when he's saying this aerodynamic sweet spot is where there's the least resistance, right? There's less air that they have to work through. So the spot with the least resistance, I see it's most likely to what? Describe how the proper structural design of an airplane, once again, we're not talking about airplanes. B, show that the flying can be an exhilarating experience. No, that's a value judgment. This is a scientific essay. C, describe the bird's synchronized wing movement. All right, that's still not, still not our answer, right? When we're talking about synchronized wing movement, that's not talking about that aerodynamic sweet spot. And D, suggest a certain position in a V formation has the least amount of wind resistance. Absolutely. Our answer there is going to be D for 30. All right, 31 is using line 72. Ripple most nearly means what? Well, let's go to 72. We're going to underline the word ripple. We've got ripple is right here, right? So we're going to go through read that sentence and come up with their own answer first. So they plan to investigate how the animals decide who sets the course and the pace and whether a mistake by the leader can ripple through the rest of the flock and cause traffic jams, right? Ripple here means spread, right? Whether a mistake made by the leader can spread through the rest of the flock. So that would be what I'm looking for in my answer choices. So I go down, I see we have spread B and that'll be my answer. We wouldn't say that it fluctuates. We wouldn't say that it's a wave or undulates, right? It spreads, right? All right, so now we can go and move on to passage four. Questions 32 to 41 are based on that. Passage one is adopted from Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, volume two, originally published in 1840. And passage two is adopted from Harriet Taylor Mill, Enfranchisement of Women, originally published in 1851. As United States and European societies grew increasingly democratic during the 19th century, debates arose about whether freedoms enjoyed by men should be extended to women as well. So I'll go ahead and read passage one, answer the questions about passage one, and then I'll move on to passage two. All right, passage one. I've shown how democracy destroys or modifies the different inequalities which originate in society. But is this all, or does it not ultimately affect that great inequality of man and women, which has seemed up to the present day to be eternally based in human nature? I believe that the social changes which bring nearer to the same level the father, the son, the master, and the servant, and superiors and inferiors, generally speaking, will raise women and make her more and more the equal of men. But here, more than ever, I feel the necessity of making myself clearly understood, for there is no subject on which the coarse and lawless fancies of our age have taken a freer range. There are people in Europe who, confounding together the different characteristics of the sexes, would make of man and women beings not only equal but alike. They would give to both the same functions, impose on both the same duties, and grant to both the same rights. They would mix them in all things, their occupations, their pleasures, their business, and may be readily conceived that by thus attempting to make one sex equal to the other, both are degraded. And from so preposterous a medley of the works of nature, nothing could ever result but weak men and disorderly women. It is not thus that the Americans understand that species of democratic equality which may be established between the sexes. They admit that as nature has appointed such wide differences between the physical and moral constitution of man and women, her manifest design was to give a distinct employment to their various faculties. And they hold that improvement does not consist in making beings so dissimilar to pretty nearly the same things, but in getting each of them to fulfill their respective tasks in the best possible manner. The Americans have applied to the sexes the great principle of political economy, which governs the manufacturers of our age by carefully dividing the duties of man from those of women, in order that the great work of society may be better carried on. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and answer questions based on passage one first, and then I'll read passage two. As used in line nine, raise most nearly means, so I'm going to go to line nine, underline raise, read the sentence, and come up with my answer before I look at the answer choices. All right, so I've got, I believe the social changes which bring nearer to the same level of the father and the son, the master and the servant, and superiors and inferiors, generally speaking, will raise women and make her more and more the equal of man. 
All right. Well, right here, what raise is essentially meaning is it will elevate women to that same status as man. So my answer there, when I come down, it should be something along the lines of elevate, elevate or lift women to that same status as men. So my answer there, I see I have elevate. It's not going to be nurture. It's not going to be cultivate. And it's not going to be increase. My answer there will be D. All right, in passage one, Tocqueville implies that treatment of men and women is identical in nature would have which, consequ which consequence? Well, she says it'd be harmful for both, right? She says that they would both be degraded. So look at our answer choices. A, neither sex would feel oppressed. That's incorrect. B, both sexes would be greatly harmed. Yes, that is her argument, right? Men, answer choice C, I'll just show you why the other ones are wrong. Men would try to reclaim their lost authority. She never makes that statement. And D, men and women would have privileges they don't need. She never makes that statement. All right, which choice provides the best evidence for that answer? Well, if we go back up, I can go ahead and show you guys where it is. There's a very clear sentence where she says this, right? Let's see. It's right here, right? So it may be readily conceived that thus by attempting to make one sex equal to the other, both are degraded. That's going to be my answer, and that's going to be 22 to 24, because that clearly states that it would be harmful to both sexes. So our answer there is going to be choice C. All right, now we can go ahead and move on. We've got question 35. We see that that's in line 53, which is part of passage 2. So I'm going to read passage 2 right now. As society was constituted until the, few, the last few generations, inequality was at its very basis. Association grounded on equal rights scarcely existed. To be equals was to be enemies. Two persons could hardly cooperate in anything or meet in any amicable relation without the laws appointing that one of them should be the superior of the other. Mankind has outgrown the state, and all things now tend to substitute, as the general principle of human relationships, a just equality instead of the dominion of the strongest. But of all relations, that between men and women being the nearest and most intimate and connected with the greatest number of strong emotions was sure to be the last to throw off the old rule and receive the new. For in proportion to the strength of a feeling is the tenacity with which it clings to the forms and circumstances with which it has even accidentally become associated. The proper sphere for all human beings is the largest and highest which they are able to attain. What this is cannot be ascertained without complete liberty of choice. Let every occupation be open to all, without favor or discouragement to any, and employment will fall in the hands of those men or women who are found by experience to be the most capable of worthily exercising them. There need be no fear that women will take out of the hands of men any occupation which men perform better than they. Each individual will prove his or her capacities in the only way which capacities can be proved by trial, and the world will have the benefit of the best faculties of, its all, of all its inhabitants. But to interfere beforehand by any arbitrary limit and declare that whatever be the genius, talent, energy, or force of the mind of an individual of a certain sex or class, those faculties shall not be exerted, or shall be exerted only in some few of the many modes in which others are permitted to use theirs, is not only an, is not only an injustice to the individual and a detriment to society which loses what it can ill spare, but is also the most effectual way of providing that in the sexes or class so fettered, the qualities which are not permitted to be exercised shall not exist. All right, so as used in line 53, dominion most nearly means what? I'm going to go to 53, underline dominion, and read the sentence. Mankind has outgrown the state, and all things now tend to substitute as the general principle of human relationships. A just equality, instead of the dominion of the strongest, of the strongest, right? Or instead of the domination of the strongest, right? Instead of the power being held in the strongest hands, right? So I'm looking for instead of instead of the dominion of the strongest, right? Instead of the domination of the strongest, or them having power, right? The supremacy, that's a great one, right? The supremacy of the, of the strongest would most nearly mean the dominion, right? The strong have all the power, right? They are quote unquote supreme. So supremacy will be my answer there, not territory, not ownership, and not omnipotence. All right, 36, in passage two, Mill most strongly suggests that gender roles are resistant to change because what? Well, she talks about how men and women are very close, right? Much closer than the other groups, therefore they're more resistant to change. And I also have to provide evidence, right? So if you look at my answer choices, I have A, have long served as the basis for the formal organizations of society. That is not going to be my answer. Are matters of deeply entrenched, entrenched tradition? Yes, right? Those matters, they've gone on for years. Those two, those two sexes are very close, right? They're matters that are deeply entrenched in tradition of both American and European, right? So we can go ahead and get rid of C and D. But C it can be influenced by legislative reforms. We don't discuss that. B, benefit the groups and institutions currently in power. We don't really discuss that either. All right, so now we got to go find evidence. All right, so if I think about where my evidence was, just off the top of my head, I'm really not looking at 43 to 44 and 46 to 49 because that was more talking about how the formal organizations of society were based on that. But after that, we start getting in to the relationship between male and female, right, and those those breaking of, uh, of gender roles. So I see that I'm going to kind of start looking at 5861 just as far as where I was.
start looking. All right, so I see I have, we'll start here so you guys can get kind of a good idea as we go into that piece, right? Because it's a little bit tricky. So we have, but all of all relationships that between men and women being the nearest and most intimate and connected with the greatest number of strong emotions was sure to be the last to throw off the old rule and receive the new for in proportion to the strength of a feeling is the tenacity with which it clings to the forms and circumstances with which it has even accidentally become associated. All right, so this is kind of complex, but I'm going to break this down for you. When we say, when we say in the beginning, right, so we're going from, let's see what our, I'll see what the evidence line it gives me is, so I can give you guys a better, 58 to 61 in proportion to associated. All right, when we start here, in proportion, in proportion to the strength of the feeling, okay, we know the, the feelings between males and females who are in that relationship is strong, right, is the tenacity, right, very strong feelings with which it clings to the forms and circumstances with which it has even accidentally become associated. That's talking about tradition, right? How that those feelings between males and females are clinging to that tradition that they have accidentally become associated to, those gender roles. So that's showing you why our answer choice C will be correct, and that's supporting that matters are deeply entrenched in tradition. Both, are, both authors would most likely agree that changes in gender roles that they describe would be what? Well, they both say that they're part of a broad social shift toward greater equality, right? They reference, each of them are talking about how there's the relationship between employer and employee and all these other relationships that are growing toward equality. So our answer there will be A, right? They don't each, they don't each discuss any of these, right? Or they don't both discuss both of those. All right, so now we can go ahead and move on to 39. We've got Tocqueville and passage one would most likely characterize the position taken by Mill in 65 to 69. And passage two as what? All right, well, let's go to 65 to 69 and let's see what that says first of all. So when we do that, we are going to go all the way up. We see we've got right here, we've got let every occupation be open to all without favor or discouragement to any and employment will fall into the hands of those men and women who are found by experience to be the most capable of worthily exercising them, right? So she's saying we shouldn't restrict what men and women do as careers, let whoever's best at the job take it, right? Well, the author of passage one is going to disagree with that, right? She makes the argument that it should not be that way. She thinks that these gender roles are important because they're natural, right? Or she thinks that they're natural, right? She thinks that men and women are different and therefore need to stay in their, in their same, same sort of careers that they historically have, right? That's her argument there. So she's going to portray it as, or she's going to see that, she's going to characterize that position as ill-advised, right? but she will still acknowledge it's consistent with the view of other advocates of gender inequality, right? She's not gonna view it as less radical about gender roles than it might initially seem because she's actually gonna view it as radical, right? So we can get rid of A. B, she's not gonna view it as persuasive in the abstract but difficult to implement in practice, right? And D, she's not gonna view it as compatible with economic progress in the US but not in Europe because we don't draw into that distinction at all. All right, question 40. Which choice best describes the way that the two authors conceive of the individuals proper position in society. So which choice best describes the ways these two authors conceive of the individual's proper position? Well, the author of passage one, right, Tocqueville, she believes that that position is importantly, like its definition pretty much is, the way that it's defined is kind of by that person's sex, right? Whereas Mill believes it should be defined by that person's ability to perform tasks, right? The ability for them to do well in a career, right? So we're gonna look for an answer choice that highlights those two beliefs. So we look at A, we have Tocqueville believes an individual's position should be defined in important ways by that individual's sex. Yes, that is her argument, right? And then Mill believes that an individual's abilities, right, what they can do in that career should be the determining factor. And that is the correct distinction between those two. So our answer for 40 will be A. We got 41 based on passage one, Mill would most likely say that the app, or based on passage two, Mill would most likely say the application of the great principle of political economy in lines 38 to 39 to gender roles has which effect. All right, well, let's go to 38 to 39. We see that we've got, the Americans have applied to the sexes the great principle of political economy which governs the manufacturers of our age by carefully dividing the duties of man from those of women or the great work of society may be better carried on. All right, so if we go down to 41, what would Mill say about that? application to gender roles has what effect? What would she say? Well, she would argue that it prevents many men and women from developing to their full potential because they can't pursue that career that they're best at, right? Women can't pursue those careers that are in the men's field, even if they're better at them than men. And men can't pursue those careers that are in, in historically women's fields, right? Even though those men may be better at those. 
So what we're doing there is we're preventing many women, men and women from developing to their full potential by restricting it to those gender roles. So our answer there is going to be A. All right, now we can go and move on to the, our last passage, which questions 42 to 52 are based on. This passage is adopted from Brian Green, How the Higgs Boson Was Found, published in 2013 by the Smithsonian Institution. The Higgs Boson is an elementary particle associated with the Higgs field. Experiments conducted in 2012 to 2013 tentatively confirmed the existence of the Higgs Boson and thus of the Higgs field. All right, I'm going to read the passage. If you've already read the passage, you can go ahead and skip about three minutes ahead to where I'll be getting into the answer explanations and tips and tricks. All right, nearly half a century ago, Peter Higgs and a handful of other physicists were trying to understand the origin of a basic physical feature, mass. You can think of mass as an object's heft, or a little more precisely, as the resistance it offers to having its motion changed. Push on a freight train or a feather to increase its speed, and the resistance you feel reflects its mass. At a microscopic level, the freight train's mass comes from its constituent molecules and atoms, which are themselves built from fundamental particles, electrons and quarks. But where do the masses of these and other fundamental particles come from? When physicists in the 1960s modeled the behavior of these particles using equations rooted in quantum physics, they encountered a puzzle. If they imagined that the particles were all massless, then each term in the equation clicked into a perfectly symmetric pattern, like the tips of a perfect snowflake. And this symmetry was not just mathematically elegant, it explained patterns evident in the experimental data. But, and here's the puzzle, physicists knew that the particles did have the mass, and when they modified the equations, to account for this fact, the mathematical harmony was spoiled. The equations became complex and unwieldy, and worse, still inconsistent. What to do? Here's the idea put forward by Higgs. Don't, show, don't shove the particles' masses down the throat of the beautiful equations. Instead, keep the equations pristine and symmetric, but consider them operating within a, par within a peculiar environment. Imagine that all of the space is uniformly filled with an invisible substance now called the Higgs field that exerts a drag force on particles when they accelerate through it. Push on a fundamental particle in an effort to increase its speed, and according to Higgs, you would feel this drag force as a resistance. Justifiably, you would interpret the resistance as the particle's mass. For a mental toehold, I think of a ping-pong ball submerged in water. When you push on the ping-pong ball, it feels much more massive than it does outside of water. Its interaction with the watery environment has the effect of endowing it with mass. So with particles submerged in the Higgs field, in 1964, Higgs submitted a paper to a prominent physics journal in which he formulated this idea mathematically. The paper was rejected, not because it contained a technical error, but because the premise of an invisible something permeating space, interacting with particles to provide their mass, well, it all just seemed like heaps of overwrought speculation. The editors of the journal deemed it of no obvious relevance to physics, but Higgs persevered. And his revised paper appeared later that year in another journal, and physicists took the time and physicists who took the time to study the proposal gradually realized that this idea was a stroke of genius, one that allowed them to have their cake and eat it too. In Higgs' scheme, the fundamental equations can retain their pristine form because the dirty work of providing the particle's mass is relegated to the environment. While I wasn't around to witness the initial rejection of Higgs' proposal in 1964, while I was around, but only barely, I can attest that by the mid-1980s the assessment had changed. The physics community had, for the most part, fully bought into the idea that there was a Higgs field permeating space. In fact, in a graduate course, I took that covered what's known as the standard model of particle physics, the quantum equations physicists have assembled to describe the particles of matter and the dominant forces by which they influence each other. The professor presented the Higgs field with such certainty that for a long while I had no idea it had yet to be established experimentally. On occasion, that happens in physics. Mathematical equations can sometimes tell such a convincing tale that they can seemingly radiate reality so strongly that they become entrenched in the vernacular, in the vernacular of working physicists, even before there's data to confirm them. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and get into question 42. Over the course of the passage, the main focus shifts from what? All right, well, if we think about it, in the beginning of the passage, right, and I'll show you this as well, we talk about the Higgs field, right? It's all about the origins of the Higgs field, what he was studying, and then it gives an explanation of what the Higgs field is. But then as we move on, we see we talk more about the discipline in physics where it takes a, a while, like it takes some time, right, for an idea, or not an idea, but I guess kind of an idea, or a hypothesis, right, to be fully established, right, and how the reaction by the scientific community can take time. So if we go ahead and look at our choices for 42, we have A, a technical account of the Higgs field to a description of it aimed at a broad audience. No, because that doesn't take account for our last couple paragraphs. B, a review of Higgs works to a contextualization of the, that work within Higgs era. Also no, because we're not taking into account 
that, that last couple paragraphs. See an explanation. Also, it's not a review of Higgs' work, right? Really, that's the big issue with B, is it's not a review of his work. It's just we're explaining it, right? We're analyzing it. We're not reviewing it. So we can get rid of B. C, an explanation of the Higgs field to a discussion of the response to Higgs theory. Absolutely, right? We're explaining what the Higgs field is and its origins. Then we move on to discuss how it was received by the public with the author's anecdote from his physics class, right? So our answer there is going to be C. And it's not going to be D, an analysis of the Higgs field to a suggestion of future discoveries because we don't suggest any future discoveries. 43, the main purpose of the analogy of the ping pong ball is to what? Okay, whenever you have a scientific essay like this and you're on the reading section and there's a commonplace thing like that, like with this ping pong ball, understand that it's likely there to explain a more abstract concept in simpler terms, right? So that the average reader can understand that. So that's one big idea that you should really take away from the reading sections, right? You want to make sure you understand that, especially on the science passages, the science passages that's kind of prevalent. So we're going to say in line 40 is to not popularize our little known fact, but to clarify that abstract scientific concept, right? That's a big theme on the science reading sections that I think you guys should really pay attention to. So make sure that you understand that, right? If you're asked to what the purpose of is an analogy on a science section and it's describing something in commonplace terms that a normal commonplace, not science, not a science nerd would understand, right? That's going to be clarifying an abstract concept, right? Or simplifying it for the average person. All right, 44, the author most strongly suggests that the reason the scientific community initially rejected Higgs' idea was that the idea, what? Well, it was not because the math was wrong. The math was correct, but it just didn't have experimental evidence, right? So it appeared to have little empirical basis. We know it's not A because A says address the problem unnoticed by other physicists. He was working with other physicists and they all noticed it. B only worked if the equations were flawless. Well, it did work, right? So we can't say that, right? And then C, it rendered accepted theories in physics obsolete. It did not, right? It was trying to make a solution to these. They didn't even have the theories, right? It was pretty much proposing that theory, right? All right, so now we know that that's D. We're asked for evidence. All right, well, that evidence, right, it's going to be up here. I'll go ahead and find it for you. We've got, but Higgs persevered in his, let's see. It is, okay, right here. All right, so we've got the paper was rejected, right? Not because it contained a technical error. So that's showing it's not because the math had to be flawless or anything, but because the premise of an invisible something permeating space interacting with particles to provide their mass, well, it all just seemed like heaps of overwrought speculation, right? There wasn't that experimental evidence yet. So that's going to be my answer, and that is from 48 to 53. So that's going to be my lines. So I'll go find that in my answer choices. I see that that's answer choice C. All right, 46. The author notes one reason Higgs theory gained acceptance was what? Well, if you think back to the passage, it said it let scientists have their cake and eat it too. What does that mean? It means it let scientists accept two conditions that had previously seemed irreconcilable. That's what that phrase is doing, right? And our next question asks for evidence. So I'm actually going to find where it says that because I'm confident that that's going to be my answer, right? Unless it doesn't even have those lines. If it doesn't have those answer, those lines in one of those A through D answer choices, I would be shocked, right? So I'm going to look at it. I see I have have their cake and eat it too, right? Going to 60. So I'd be looking for something from lines, let's see, probably like 55, but Higgs persevered and his revised paper appeared later in a journal and physicists who took the time to study the proposal gradually realized it was a stroke of genius when allowed them to have their cake and eat it too. In Higgs' scheme, the fundamental equations can retain their pristine form because the dirty work of providing the particles, the particles mass is relegated to the environment, right? So something like 55 to 63, but I would want to make sure it contained this right here, have their cake and eat it too. I want to make sure it has that 59 to 60 for sure, but I'm guessing it's probably 55 to 63. All right, so I'm going to go down and look, and I see, yep, it's 55 to 63, so my answer there will be C. Which statement best describes the technique the author uses to advance the main point of the last paragraph? All right, the technique he uses to advance that main point of that last paragraph. Let's go find it. Our last paragraph's here. So what technique does he use? Well, he's using his personal anecdote, right? His personal experience. And what is his goal with doing that? Well, his goal with doing that is to explain how mathematical equations sometimes can tell such a convincing tale that they become, they become essentially entrenched in physics, right? So he's describing that discipline in physics where if the math works, eventually it can become accepted, right? And he's doing that through that personal anecdote. 
And that anecdote, if you don't know what an anecdote is, it's just kind of a personal story or experience, right? So we have A, he accounts personal experience to illustrate a characteristic of the discipline of physics. Yes, right? That discipline is that they will accept that mathematical equation as long as it works, right? But it may take time. And then also, he's using that personal experience, that personal anecdote. So our answer for 48 is A. All right, 49 is using line 77, establish most nearly means. I'm going to go to line 77, underline establish, and come up with my own answer so I'm not swayed by the answer choices. So we have, the professor presented the Higgs field with such certainty that for a long while I had no idea it had yet to be established experimentally. Established here is meaning, meaning proven experimentally, right? So anything like proven experimentally, right? Or confirmed, right? Or validated, right? That's another great one. Validated will be our answer there, right? Validated experimentally is the same as proven experimentally or established experimentally, right? not founded, not introduced, or enacted, right? All right, question 50. What purpose does the graph serve in relation to, in relation to the passage as a whole? Let's look at the graph. All right, we've got years from introduction of concept of particle to experimental con confirmation. We've got our years on our x-axis, and we have our names of different particles on our y-axis. So what this is doing is it's showing how the Higgs boson, right, it took so much longer from when it was introduced to get confirmed than all these others. So that's what it's really doing. It's putting that length of time in context, right? It indicates, we'll read through our answer choices. It, A, it indicates the scientific community's quick acceptance of the Higgs boson was typical. Absolutely not. It wasn't a quick acceptance. B, it places the discussion of the reception of the Higgs boson into a broader scientific context. Absolutely, right? It's showing how long it took these other similar particles to get, to get confirmed, right? So our answer there is going to be B. All right, question 51. Which statement is best supported by the data presented in the graph? We got, we're just going to have to go through these A through D, right? So you got W boson and Z boson were proposed and experimentally confirmed at about the same time. Go ahead and look at that. And we see that they are, right? They're each proposed right there and they're each confirmed right there. So that'll be our answer. And just in my personal experience, just in my personal experience going through these practice tests, one thing I've noticed is when we're asked for statements supported by the data presented in the graph like this, and you're just given four statements and you don't have anything to go on in the prompt, I've noticed that it seems, and I, I haven't done the math, but it seems that most of the time the answer choices are in the beginning, right? So they're closer to A or B or C than, it, than they are to D. Just, just an observation, right? I'm not saying that that's mathematically true on all the practice tests because I haven't done the math, but it just seems like that to me. 52, based on the graph, the author's depiction of Higgs theory in the mid-1980s is most analogous to which hypothetical situation? All right, well, if we look at his description of it in the mid-1980s, let's see where we are. All right, right here. It talks about how in the mid-1980s, right, the assessment had changed. The physics community had, for the most part, most part, fully bought into that idea of the Higgs field, right? But if we look at our graph, it's showing us that in the mid-80s, right, it still hadn't been confirmed. So we'd be looking for a situation where something is accepted but hasn't been confirmed yet, but it's accepted and used by scientists. So we've got A, the muon neutral was widely, widely disputed until being confirmed. No, we're looking for where it's accepted before confirmation. B, few scientists in 2012 doubted the reality of the tau neutrino. That doesn't fit. C, no physicist prior to 1960 considered the possibility of W or Z boson. No, D, most physicists in 1940 believed in the existence of the electron neutrino. We know that'll be answered by default, but I'll go ahead and support that by showing you. So it says in 1940 they believed in the existence of electron neutrino. We see that's before confirmation, right? Just like in the Higgs boson. So that supports D as our answer, right? If you just wanted me to show you why, right? So that'll be D right there. Thank you for watching Preeminent Test Prep. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share as we'll be releasing more videos to help you prepare for the SAT.